Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Digital Savages Challenging the Status Quo podcast with your host, Amir Sabirovich. In the previous episode of Challenging the Status Quo, our guest was Karim Hashem, and here is a short part of our interview. I was very miserable. I was miserable a lot of years, actually. So I, I was working at the government for two or three years and going to work every day to do something you don't really love really makes you think and i i decided for myself i can't take this longer you know how can i do this my entire life i i cannot but i know a lot of people are doing that because they don't know better so what i did i made a plan you know all right Karim, you're in this situation now you're kind of stuck because you started something but you're not really stuck if you are financially independent. So what I did is I saved money during while I was working and I decided to quit, to think. So after two years, I quit my job and I was able to live without working for about a year. That was Karim Hashem. If you didn't have the pleasure of listening to the full interview, go one episode back, listen to Karim and hear everything he has to say about life of fulfillment and chasing your dreams. But now, let's tune in to our next guest. Today, our guest is Vivian Aqua, workplace wellness advocate, helping managers with keeping their people engaged and energized. That sounds like we want to know more. LinkedIn live producer, public speaker, digital strategist, and a specialist in sustainable employability. Welcome, Vivian. Thank you, Ami. It was it is great to be here. Looking forward to our conversation. Hey, you, you probably have listened to our podcast and I've told you so much about it, but I'm really curious about your background and how you got where you are right now. And please don't spare us the details. Okay. So um, I have a background in finance. I got my uh, business economics and I've been working as a financial consultant for about 15 years. And after being in the finance world, I decided to do something that I always dreamt of doing. And that is making the the leap towards IT, building bridges between finance and IT. And uh, in my last career as an IT consultant, I became pregnant I was at the t- it was 2013 at the time and you have to know that I shared with my then managers I had 5 at the time in a small company I shared with them that I was pregnant with 5 weeks because I was afraid of the backlash I was afraid of them being too judgy about me calling in sick because I had in the beginning I really had some trouble with my pregnancy And I told my managers before I even told my friends and family. Uh, Once I told them, that's when some of the harassing started. So um, I faced pregnancy discrimination. And uh, at the time that my son was about four months, I decided not to come back anymore because um, I realized that the environment that I was working in was toxic not only for me, but also for my, you know, my partner and my child. And I did not uh, keep my son. Uh, I did not carry my son for about nine months to, for him to meet a depressed mom or for him to meet his stressed mom. So I quit my job and realizing at four months, I noticed that my son was watching me, following me all the time. And then I realized that I am a role model from day one. And that's when I started looking into into my own health. So I first started out as a nutrition advocate. And uh, people, uh, people came up to me asking me for advice, asking me for their health. I even did a cooking program called Cooking Back to Our Roots. That's where I learned a lot of the the producing skills, the life producing skills. And um, four years ago, I noticed that a lot of people were complaining about their workplace and about their managers, about their colleagues. And I knew I had to do something about that because I am raising a child who at the moment is six, but he's a biracial boy. So once he becomes uh, an adult, if he becomes a manager or having his own camp company, 
it's up to him. But I know that I want to do my best to create that best workplace that he is entitled to, uh, better than what I had. Um, and that's why I became a workplace wellness advocate to make that difference, to make the world a better place by starting from the workplace. And there is so much work to do. Hey, and, uh, uh, of course there is a, a, a huge gap before you finish the school. Can you, mm-hmm. can you tell, tell us a bit about where you grew up, how that went, uh, mm-hmm. were you always living in the Netherlands or, yes. uh, so, so, so some background to before you started uh, the university? Yeah. So, um, I'm born and raised here in Amsterdam, but my roots lay in Ghana. My parents came from Ghana and I have always been bound uh, in Amsterdam, though I moved away for a bit for a, a different relation, but um, I am tall. I'm one meter eighty six, and I'm uh, plus six foot tall. So uh, know that uh, when you see me, you see a woman standing. But know that twenty years ago, or maybe let's say thirty five years ago, because I am turning forty, I uh, was always an introvert. I always made myself invisible even though you can't see me i dressed myself very invisible i uh didn't want to stand out because my my length was already stand, you know making me stand out and i didn't want to put all the attention towards me so i'm learning all these valuable lessons also my upbringing is bringing me valuable lessons lessons that i am now in a way uh, reframing it with, uh, with, uh, with my son, with bringing up my son. And I've always been curious and I've always had an interest for the IT. I've always had an interest in creating a better environment for everybody because that's where I get my warmth from. And I, uh, I, the reason why has to do with my, my grandmother was the same. She was the same. Okay, and uh, can, can you d- describe or how was it growing up uh, in Amsterdam? Um, growing up in Amsterdam, for me personally, um, Amsterdam is very worldly. It's international. So I have seen all the places in Amsterdam. So we used to live in Amsterdam North, in Amsterdam West, and then we went to Centrum. And the last place that my parents lived was Amsterdam East. And uh, you have so many different cultures, and that's also a good thing when you when you are a foodie like me, you can taste the world without even leaving the place that you live. Uh, I had a, a good upbringing. I uh, was was content, but I knew there was so much more within me, and um, I realize now that I, I have so much more potential within me. So. I would say, yes, I, I'm happy with the way I, that I was brought up. That 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 sounds, uh, I mean, you found yourself eventually. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the upbringing and the influence of your parents, your grandparents, etc., right? so mm-hmm. they're all accountable in definitely, the end. Definitely, definitely. I mean, I come from a background where family means a, a lot. So... Um, my father's friends are my uncles. My mother's friends uh, are my aunties. And everybody is connected to everybody. So um, in that time, we didn't have WhatsApp. But my, <laughs> there were so many people who knew about me. And if I was doing something that wasn't good, they my parents knew before I even came home. So now that you have WhatsApp, I fear for the youth now. But there, there is a very tight connection with the Ghanaian community in Amsterdam. Yes. You you, you had the, the cameras without cameras. Yes, definitely. <laughs> live ones, live ones. Definitely, yes. Hey, and now that uh, you're doing what you what you love and where mm-hmm. your passion lays, mm-hmm. um, what is your definition of success? When are you successful and how, how do you feel about that? What, can you describe the feeling behind it? I think that uh, for myself, I start each year with a mood board or a vision board or whatever board you want to call it, because I think it's important to define your goals and tweak it when a pandemic happens or pivot it <laughs> when a pandemic happens. 
uh, in but case it, of apocalypse yes, read this <laughs> definitely definitely but uh you always have to have your dreams and you always have to have your goals so i can describe how my vision board looks like um i already have um humanize the works place was something that is big on that board What's also on that board is my 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 partner and my child because I value my family. Um, what's also on that board is amplifying your voice. I shared in the beginning before that I was really introverted, and if you would have told me maybe ten years ago what I would be doing now, I would have uh, slapped you in the face and say, "No, you're kidding." But I'm doing it now because I have the confidence now, and I've built up towards this moment. I've always been a talker and I love to chat with people, but most of the time I was doing that uh, behind the curtains. And to make that change that I want to, to do for the future, not only for, you know, for my son, but also for this generation, I need to speak up. And speaking up is something that I have been doing for a while, but definitely with the live streams that I've been doing with humanizing the workspace, uh, workplace has been amplified. Um, so ampli ampli amplifying my voice, it's also something that is on uh, my mood board. And of course, I have also have a target, a money target uh, on my mood board and organizing virtual summits. So there are a few things that, uh, I realize it's July and it's in the works. A few things are in the works, but um, the success already from humanizing the workplace has been humongous because I also had an image of myself flying across the whole world uh, as an international speaker. Well, that flying part because of this whole lockdown thing isn't uh, something up in the works, but it did manifest in a different way with me being invited to international events and people knowing my name, even though they don't know me, they are hearing my name or have seen a, have seen an episode of or have listened to an episode. And that in itself is huge because here I am. I was thinking that being in Amsterdam and, and you know, being acting like a, my, a mice, being quiet, even though this mice is one meter 86, I was keeping myself small. And now I know the mission that I have is, uh, I believe in it takes a village to raise a child. And that's how I treat humanizing the workplace by inviting different experts. I believe that everybody is an expert in their own way, inviting them to just have an honest conversation, just like we are doing right now, we are having right now. Hey, and and can you describe the feeling you had once you were, as you described it, a mice, and now that you have a voice? Mm -hmm. How do you feel now? Um, Compared I to that, feel, I feel that I feel valued. I feel seen. I feel uh, empowered. I feel I have a lot of confidence. And at the time, I was more thinking about what others think about me and it still matters what others think about me but I don't let it uh write my my mood or my script for the day um I'm also realizing that what I'm doing I'm live streaming on Facebook on YouTube on Twitter and on LinkedIn at the same time making myself vulnerable for other people's to comment. And uh, up to now, and I've been lucky up to now, I haven't had a bad comment and I'm not looking for one. So don't please don't, don't leave any bad comments <laughs> because what I'm doing, I'm putting my heart in this. I'm putting my heart so that this generation and the future generation can at least work in a workplace where they feel valued. So uh, that in itself um, is, is, is inspiring me, and there is this there is this quote like um, you you don't have to feel small because when you are in a room with a mosquito, who's going to win? Is it you or the mosquito? Depends on your rigor to get rid well, of him. <laughs> no, <I'm just> 
<laughs> Let's say that I don't know what's in my blood. I think I have chocolate in my blood, but the mosquito will win. And that's how I see myself when I am doing something out of my comfort zone. I always try to think of that phrase. What would you do if you had a mosquito in that room? Especially when you have a big room and you don't know where it is, the mosquito will win. It will buzz you. It will catch you. It will do something with you. It will drive you crazy. And that's what, you know, I don't want to drive people crazy. I want to inspire people like a hey, mosquito uh, is doing uh, that. Uh, 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 my tactic is to lay still until it comes and then it starts <laughs> flying around my ears and I slap myself silly. Yeah. No, I <laughs> and I miss. Miss him always. <laughs> I miss him always and I slap myself no. <laughs> so. no, we have a net just, out of safety, just so that my partner also can sleep because I, I i drove him crazy so we have a net during the summer times we have a net to at least maintain our sleep hey, and and what would be if, if i would give you a time machine and you could mm -hmm. fly to that introverted girl 15 years back yeah what would be your advice to her embrace Embrace yourself. Embrace who you are um, because you are going to be an amazing woman. You are going to do amazing things and you are going to connect amazing people with another amazing people. Um, I wish I had, you know, somebody in my circle who had give, given me that confidence boost because you have to know that I am the first of this generation Ghanaians who are here who had to find out a lot of things on her own. And I'm very resilient, but sometimes I wish I had that support system where somebody would have told me or somebody would have mentored me or guided me um, in making some of the steps. I don't doubt, I don't regret anything though, because otherwise I wouldn't be here. No, no, but it would. it's always good to have people that can can tell you that that wall is really going to hurt so mm -hmm. or how to to go around it yeah definitely and what do you do on daily basis to challenge the status quo i mean you you said enough but but still i want to underline it here if i'm looking at the recent happening so i am taking in uh I'm taking in, I'm talking about the racial uh, inequity. That is uh, a top thing at the moment right now. I am raising my voice to at least have conversations about what it is, what it is to talk about race. Because here in the Netherlands, we have some kind of a sensitivity where we don't seem to think, don't seem to see that racism is real. It's not like in the States, but it, it has a different load. And I also want people to know that every time that people of color or people of another ethnicity is facing microaggression, it feels like a macro attack. And that's how I am raising my voice to, again, make it happen for my son not to deal with the same BS that uh, a lot of people of color are dealing with at the moment and before. That's, a, an, a, I mean, if you do that on a daily basis, that mm -hmm. must be tiring. It to... is tiring. It is tiring. And that's why I, um, in the beginning when it happened, I was losing a lot of my energy, but now I found a way to dose it. And I am introverted. So I am an ambivert, um, on those days that you don't see me online or on those times that you don't see me online, I'm working, I'm writing, I'm working on other things that I still can continue with. Uh, with the fight or with the battle that I'm I'm fighting for, but in my way, in my time, and and also being mindful of my energy as well. So, what is the biggest challenge in this all? Is it understanding, no mm -hmm. common ground, or are people just raised to put other people's into squares? Mm -hmm. There are so many things happening, but. For me personally, I think that we can win so much when we get people to the listen and learn phase. I think that we have been, uh, a lot of people have been acting like an ostrich where they kept their head in the sand. And now with this whole lockdown and also the international, um, international pain that everybody, almost every country had a demonstration regarding this where it was amplified, right? And we need to hold that momentum. So when we can help people to 
at least listen and whatever it is that you want to learn from it that's that's totally fine if you don't want to learn from it then we also know but at least listen and pay you know pay uh add a, a whole lot of empathy in that mixture where when you're listening as well and, and if you tie this to your grand goal wish mm -hmm. um how would it look like and how do you how would you achieve it mm -hmm. if i fast forward to the future i would see like people who look like me but maybe talk also talk like me don't feel that they need to put on a mask or don't feel that they are the only one in the workplace or don't feel that they aren't safe in the workplace because you have to realize that there is so much talent outside but a lot of companies are losing talents because they don't pay respect or they don't create that safe environment and uh, it's a win when we can get to that safe environment it's a win when we can have conversations maybe about race but also about the other things that we need to uh, tackle to make the, the workplace human because what you need to know is people cannot be like Rona McDonald, where they are the clown and happy all the time. They also have emotions. They also go to uh, certain challenges. And when they feel safe to address certain challenges with a, a trustee or maybe with, uh, with a colleague, it feels like you can make that connection. And it feels for them, it feels like they can be their whole self. It, we we touched uh, upon this subject uh, uh, previous to the podcast, but do you feel that uh, the diversity and inclusion, so when we talk about this, I would say this should be the common way of common understanding of anybody to look at people as human beings, not mm -hmm. male, female, colored, religious, whatever, just, you know, may the best uh, uh, applicant win mm -hmm. uh, the, for the job. Yeah. That would be that 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 is my statement. So the the best guy or girl will get the job. Not uh, do you feel that diversity and inclusion is a kind of forced term for companies to just have a checkbox? Yeah, we we comply. They are treating it at the moment now, but it's up to advocates like us to challenge them and to really make an effort regarding diversity and inclusion because it's not a checkbox when they use it wisely it can become more profitable it can lead them to more business it can lead them to more uh business because uh, when i'm looking at the the demographic for the netherlands in 30 years there is there is a different demographic there are less white uh western people in uh, in the netherlands and more people with a non-western background so you also have to see, you know, you also have to look towards the future where it, when you are making steps now regarding diversity and inclusion and not only naming just the diversity officer who is the only diversity uh, person within the company. No, you have to go through all the layers of your company to see if there are um, different representations and different representations can lead to awesome Awesome products can lead to awesome clients, can lead to so much more awesome. And it's the it's the, the only way to go, right? It's the social way to go. If you want to be socially sustainable, you have to add that on the menu as well. Well, <clears throat> I hope we can tie that to your grand wish and goal and we all become global global citizens where we um, value each other on our skills and not mm -hmm. so much of how we look like or how we talk or whatever mm -hmm. get rid of the biases yes definitely but before we can do that we have to be aware of the biases and that's why um, it is so important that companies who are investing in trainings uh, whatever bias there is or investing in diversity trainings that they don't treat diversity and inclusion as a one-night stand it has to become part of the dna it has to be part of not only it has part to of be the, real yeah, yeah with real purpose and intention yeah. to to get the diversity and inclusion within True. the company and True. not be the we have 50 50 percent women 
Yeah. Just just to <laughs> be able to say that. That's a safe uh, thing to say. Sorry, that's a safe thing to say. Yeah, yeah. We want to look beyond the gender. There are so many different bias, uh, there's so many different DNI topics, labels that are available. Look beyond the gender. I would, I would almost, I'm, 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 I'm tend to, uh, um, to, to ask you what are all the uh, the abbreviations which exist among these things, but uh, I will keep I myself. Can, I can, no, I can share one of them. <laughs> yeah, is, uh, yeah, yeah, is just, just go. Just I just want, to, I want... Uh, ageism, uh, sex, religion, uh, of course, the ethnicity can be it, but also know that uh, different education background is also uh you're also adding diversity and inclusion in that right so um have different representations in your company and if you don't know how ask for experts ask for people outside of your company to support you in that process as well in on your journey Mm -hmm. i'm not going to call it a failure Mm -hmm. but what is your biggest learning moment What was your aha, your light bulb? Yeah, I don't see it as a failure. So when I started... No, no, exactly. So so what a learning moment, learning moment. The learning moment was when I started five years ago, I started also also working for... I created a a non-profit organization which which was called No Better, Do Better. And it was uh, there to raise awareness for diabetes and for being overweight because my mo- my grandmother died because of that and I wanted to do something in the non-western culture and I started working with a few scientists the only thing is that I was seen differently because I didn't have that background but I also am a firm believer and I know it for myself you don't have to have a, a certain education to know where somebody's heart, heart is at so the Working together failed because uh, of different reasons and also me not trusting them because in a way it felt like they wanted to do they wanted me to do all the job but use my my uh, my nonprofit as a way for them to gain subsidy and I saw that and three years ago um, I worked together with the Diabetes Foundation, the the Dutch Diabetes Foundation, and I created the show Cooking Back, which was the best thing that I created. And it's not a failure at all. Um, I wanted to do, it was a dream to do a cooking show and a cooking show where non-Western people from different backgrounds and we are cooking together. Because most of the times when people with a non-Western background or people from minorities are being addressed and they are talked about. And I wanted to include them because I cannot do this cooking, this healthy cooking alone. But what I can do is have these conversations with them and together we can create awareness. We can raise awareness. We can share information about what what is it like to have diabetes type 2 or type 1 or what is it like to have pregnancy and diabetes because we... Uh, sometimes people forget that we need to include the people to raise awareness, to to make that change happen for the better. And if we leave it all up to, upon the scientists, I'm not discrediting any scientists because I do know that we need them for the facts and we need them for certain things. But they sometimes also, also seem to forget the human part that you need to include the group to make change happen. And last year I ended that, um, I said goodbye to my non-profit because I wanted to focus more on Viva La Viv with what I'm doing now with Humanize the Workplace. Uh, so I felt sad of, um, you know, of uh, ending that non-profit, but I am odd the utmost proud of the things, the lessons that I learned through that organization and through what I did with my cooking program. And where do you get all that inspiration from? I, my secret is I get ideas, idea storms. So uh, a typical, a typical way of how I get my idea storm is when I have a crappy night and I wake up like four or five a.m. <laughs> and I write it down. And 
it happened to me for, for, for Humanize the Workplace. It happened to me when I started Viva La Vive. And it happens for me to me from time to time. So I have to have uh, some lows to think and create and also inspiration, right? Because I like reading and I read, uh, I listen to a lot of audiobooks. And being inspired and seeing people, what they do, it, it, something happens in my brain. See it uh, in a way, I also see it as my connection with my gran, my connection with, uh, with my spirituality. I'm not religious, but I believe in there is, there is more outside of, you know, just us. And also having that savviness of trusting and believing in yourself, because sometimes you have to fall a few times but I am resilient and I know that there is a humongous power within me and I'm happy that people are seeing it now. Uh, somebody even commented me like, you are like Oprah, but the way you do it is so much more human, authentic, and the way you engage the people with even with maybe a boring topic, you still make a boring topic sexy. And that's what I'm aiming for. So what would we, what would your superpower then be? What's your superpower? My son. Really, truly my son. <clears throat> really, because um I would say that it happened when I became a mom. It happened something released within me. There is this power, this inner Beyoncé maybe or this inner Michelle Obama or whoever the inner Oprah when I became a mother, something, some power was released in me and I am using that. I am building that. And every time that I'm looking at my son, it's that moment when I'm realizing I am fighting this battle for him. I'm advocating for a better future for him and his generation. And it has to start now because change takes time. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Mm -hmm. And what are you curious about right now? I am curious about will there ever be a moment where we are going to be able to see each other, to hug each other, to even travel because the, the, the state that we are in right now, it is scary. Um, for me, yeah, it is a bit scary, but also for me, I mean, I'm thriving during this period. Like I said, I'm still an introvert. And this period for me is the best period because I've been nudging people towards having virtual coffees and tea for the longest when I started my career. And now I am able to have my virtual teas and coffees without people complaining. And I am curious about how long it will take for us to uh, design the new, new workable normal. Uh <clears throat> I was just going to say to you, I have a solution. Mm -hmm. We should just make the world blind. Mm. Yeah. Can you can you share more about that? Oh, imagine that everybody has to wear a blindfold. Mm. And yeah. you cannot see each other. Yeah. You just can't talk with each other. Yeah. That would eliminate uh, one of the biggest perceptions in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's why I believe in we need to listen to each other because when you're blind, you can still listen to each other and learn from what somebody else is sharing at the moment. Yeah, and your visual algorithms get shut off. Mm -hmm. True. True. This was just an epiphany on top of your curiosity for, for, <laughs> for now. <laughs> hey, that's, epiphanies are welcome. That's how that's how my dreams start, right? That's how my I, I call them my thought seeds. I plant thought seeds and, and um, want to inspire people with the thought seeds that other people are sharing so that we can hear more of these stories because stories are a way to I would love connect. to see, see this event with all different people and that they imagine and they're not told that they will be sitting among um, totally different people than them, mm -hmm. but blindfolded. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would really love that just an ex as an experiment that yes, I, I would really awesome. love look look to it with with high curiosity what will happen when the mm -hmm. blindfolds go off mm -hmm. uh, hey um if i would give you the possibility to dine with three people 
alive or dead. It doesn't matter which age, even BC, uh, uh, mm-hmm. it's all good. Who would those three people be? It's easy. The first one would be Maya Angelou because she reminds me so much of my gran. Um, she has that inner wisdom and she has overcome so much and still managed to inspire so many people along the way. The second one would be Ava DuVernay. She is the producer of uh, This Is Us, 13th, and so much more. And the reason why I am saying her name is her one of her quotes, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but she shared that she was knocking on a lot of doors and realizing that there were there weren't any doors opening for her she decided to create her own platform she decided to create her own production studio and she decided to become one of the best female producers who knows how to tell uh social justice stories I look up uh, to her and the stories that she's sharing, and that's also the reason why I keep pushing with Let's Humanize the Workplace, because I want to be that version of Ava, but then for the workplace. And another guest that I would like to talk to is Michelle Obama, just because she... She has her own persona, and even though she is known as the wife of uh, Barack Obama, she is her own. And if you look at so many presidential wives, more most of them aren't their own persona, but she is her own persona. And the way she inspired a lot of women, still is inspiring a lot of women to stand on their own ground and just become... I went to her um, went to her event. Uh, I think not last year, but the year before, and it was amazing because she touched my heart. She's touched my mind, and we need more stories like that. So, in a way, it's all about the people who are sharing valuable stories that touch the heart. That's an impressive list, and I believe mm-hmm. it's achievable. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, at least now you don't have to go through the security in White House. Now you can just reach out to her and let's. I'm I'm buying dinner, whatever you want. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. hey, we're uh, reaching the end of the podcast, mm-hmm. um, and my final question for you or question is your key takeaway for the audience. Mm-hmm. So, what would you like to share with them as your takeaway, summarizing? your experience and life and uh, preparing them for the future? I would like to say treat somebody else as the way you like to be treated. Um, humanizing the workplace doesn't end, you know, the humanizing part doesn't end only in the workplace. It also is how you are outside of the workplace. So uh, treat others the way you want to be treated. And then you that- increase the human part itself short but powerful yeah vivian it was a pleasure talking with you thank you very much for your openness and your message to the world uh, thank and you I for having me fully support everything you said and um, we'll fight along uh, a side of you to to achieve this mm-hmm. um, and i wish you all the best thank you thank you amir for having me and it was a very engaging interesting interview thank you Thank you, Vivian. Have an awesome day. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for listening, dear ladies and gentlemen. That was Vivian Aqua. Join me next week for the interview with Mark van Rijmenam. He's a speaker, strategist, and author on the future of work. And here is a short part of our conversation. Well, I, I think it, it's very much tied to technology because in the end, uh, within the hospitality industry, it's all about um, caring for someone and being able to, to, to host someone and then deliver the best customer service. Um, and I think the same applies to technology. We should use technology uh, for the betterment of, 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 of humanity, for the betterment of, of, of delivering a product or service that is there for us, not the other way around. Did this spark your attention? 
attention. Well, join me next week and hear everything Mark has to say about future of work, new organizations, and of course, technology. For now, this was Challenging the Status Quo podcast with your host, Amir Sabirovich. Ciao!